Is everyone on that we're expecting? Yes. Is it time for me to call the meeting to order? Yes. All right. Then I will uh, call the July 23rd meeting of the External Relations Committee to order. Um, do you want to take roll call or do you want to proceed with approval of the minutes? I'll, I'll take roll call. All right, I'm Robbie Ash and I'm here. <laughs> okay. Robert, Robert, Roberta Abdul Salam. Jim Duran. Roderick Edmund. William Floyd. Roderick Fireson. Present. Ryan Glover. Terry Griffin. Frida Hardage. Present. Alicia Ivy. Present. Russell Murray. Al Khan. Present. Rita Scott. Rita Scott. She's on. Okay, thank you. Um, Christopher Thompson. <coughs> Thomas Worthy. Mr. Ash, we have six persons, six board members present. Thank you very much. I will uh, ask for a motion to approve the May 21st External Relations Committee meeting minutes. I uh, move to approve Frida Hardage. Second, Ivy. The motion is properly made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, how are we doing this these days? Are we? Check for abstentions and uh, no votes. Uh, are there any abstentions? Are there any no votes? Hearing none, the motion passes unanimously. The next item on the agenda is a briefing for MARTA's film policy. Mr. Flood. Good morning. Good morning, sir. How are you? Mr. Mr. Tob is going to pull up a uh, screen for us. Are you seeing the full screen version? No, we're seeing the notes version. Okay, hold on. Sorry to interrupt, Mr. Yeah, I'll do it this way. All right, are you now seeing the, the full version? No, still seeing the notes version. Okay, sorry. This is one of the trickiest bits. We'll get it. This is the part of the agenda where we just get to watch a movie for a couple hours, right? <laughs> the 
previews, the, the trailers. I'll just go back one. You're still in. You're still in. Um... It needs to be in slideshow yeah. view. Just put it in slideshow view. Yeah, I'm trying to get it into the right view. I apologize. Yeah. All right, Virgil, I think we're good now. All right, let's see. All right, so good morning, Chairman Ash, Mr. Parker, members of the External Relations Committee. My name is Virgil Flood. I'm the Assistant General Manager of External Affairs. My purpose today is to provide a brief overview of MARTA's history in film and media and share a little bit about our updated film policy. Let's stay right there for now. Uh, for today's agenda, we'll start with an overview of our internal processes for managing film requests. We'll also review our safety and security measures, especially those that have been implemented since COVID-19. We'll share so how MARTA stacks up to our, some of our peer agencies. And finally, we'll discuss next steps for the filming efforts at the authority. Next. So, um, I'm sure you've looked up at a recent movie or commercial and recognized one of Marta's treasured assets, whether it's a bus, a train, or even a station. And you might wonder to yourself, how does that get to the, in, in that film? Well, the short answer is External Affairs, led by Alexia Wynn and supported uh, by Lyle Harris. But they, of course, don't do it alone. In fact, we rely on a number of departments to ensure all of our requests are safe and pose a minimal impact to our customers. I'll discuss the broad range of projects that are a part of an influx of requests that external affairs feels throughout the year. So let's start by taking a step back, back to 1981 to that Oscar worthy cult classic Escape from New York. Marta's rail lines were relatively new at the time and it was a major draw for director John Carpenter who reimagined MARTA as a Manhattan subway system. Uh, I must say that Kurt Russell and I were quite a bit younger at the time. Um, I'll mention to you as well that MARTA has been featured in more than 50 major productions in the last five years alone, including Netflix films Thunder Force, featuring Octavia Spencer and Melissa McCarthy filmed at Avondale, Holiday with Emma Roberts filmed at Lindbergh, The Tomorrow Wars filmed at C Civic Center, Jacob's Ladder filmed at Garnett, and one of my favorites, the Watchmen series filmed at Decatur Station, just to name a few. Now, when people think of filming on MARTA, they tend to think of major productions, but actually we receive requests of all sizes. While MARTA remains a go-to uh, filming location for blockbuster movies, we're also a prime location for commercials, for documentaries, for music videos, and even some student film projects. Now, uh, when you look at our filming process uh, for managing the, the requests, uh, you can see this the, from this diagram that this is a very highly coordinated effort and touches quite a few people. We also have to adhere to FTA regulations and safety protocols, to make sure all the activities that take place on the system follow established best practices. It's important that we, again, minimize any impact on revenue service. Now, not every um, film goes through this entire maze, but we always have legal and we always have uh, police involved. Next slide. As I mentioned, safety and security remain our top priority at MORTA, and we require that all crew members who will be at or near our tracks, that they must go through wayside training. Uh, we coordinate these efforts with MARTA police and the FTA and require that productions have on-site emergency support and security for all their films. So where did all this interest in filming come from? Well, thanks to the Georgia Entertainment Industry Act of 2002, which was later strengthened in 2008, the state experienced a surge of productions uh, seeking the attractive, very attractive and lucrative tax credits. 
this effort shifted a number of productions away from New York and Los Angeles into the metro Atlanta area, bringing billions of dollars in economic impact to the state. In fact, in 2018, the industry generated $9.5 billion in revenue for Georgia. At MARTA, we went from fielding about three requests a year to now more than four requests per month before COVID. Now, we not only receive requests for our facilities, but also for our parking lots, for our buses, trains, the streetcar, and other prime locations throughout the system. One of our more immediate goals is to develop a digital portfolio that will essentially serve as a lookbook for our various assets. Uh, from our available spacing at parking lots to our rolling stock, this lookbook will help streamline the process for interested production companies and scouting crews by creating a single site for them to explore all of our major filming locations and doing so electronically. Here's a look at how our pricing compares with our peer agencies. We're constantly reviewing our pricing and procedures with other organizations and, and make adjustments when necessary to make sure that we have the most appropriate fee structure for our marketplace. Uh, if, if you go back, um, our overall costs in general are higher than LA, but lower than San Francisco. I think that's because Hollywood has gotten more aggressive in trying to lure productions back to Southern California that have now been uh, being worked on here in Atlanta. Next slide. Just before COVID-19 changed all of our lives, we had the pleasure of working with the legendary Sylvester Stallone, as well as the incomparable Ava DuVernay on two upcoming projects. Here you see Ms. DuVernay on the left in one of our tunnels as she prepared to direct the scene. And then on the, left, on the right, Mr. Stallone uh, is shown with Georgia State University in the background. Now, while COVID-19 uh, challenges uh, slowed our filming pace, things are starting to pick up and Marta is putting the necessary steps in place to help provide for a safe production environment. As I mentioned, uh, production activities significantly, significantly decreased due to the coronavirus. However, Marta is adopting the state's best practices for filming and productions and that will be adopted going forward. These protocols also align with the CDC's recommendations, and this modified plan covers things like safety, training, new protocols for testing, cleaning, hair and makeup, catering, and other on-site activities. These guidelines, I believe, are the reason for the requests uh, now starting to pick back up. As we envision our next steps, we're planning to create that lookbook I mentioned to highlight Marta's prime locations. We're also seeking new and creative ways to support uh, the anticipated resurgence of production requests. Also, we're in the process of finalizing our updated policy, which we'll share with you soon. Uh, we've made a number of modifications, including COVID-19 guidelines, new rail car maintenance pro protocols, updated fee structure, and an MPD Water Police Department approval process. We're engaging every department that is impacted by our film and media activities. Next slide. With an eye towards the opportunities that our film and productions efforts bring to the table, there's some key initiatives that we believe we can undertake. First, we see ways to strengthen our relationship with our jurisdictional partners, many of whom, several of whom have uh, film and production uh, organizations within them. Second, we can establish a stronger connection with the creative community in Georgia and extend our industry engagement. More importantly, we have an, an opportunity to increase our non-transit revenue, and then hopefully one day build out an office of film and media to officially house all of these functions. Before I end, I wanna share with you a video that was produced on our system by the Atlanta Falcons. Audio.
Thank you, Mr. Talbot. Um, just as a point of reference, that young lady singing the song was uh, uh, Angelica Hill, who's a 12 year old from Atlanta who was uh, contested in. 20, 2017 America's Got Talent. Um, it was really special young lady and a special time for the Falcons. Happy to answer any questions that anyone might have about our film and television policy. Hey, Virgil, I have a couple of things. Can you go back to the slide with the pricing where I can just talk? Uh, that would be number... Yeah, ten. I looked at uh, I looked at that, and I know you said you plan to go back and review the pricing, but I think there's two or three categories that we should try to charge more. I mean, you're looking at three or four thousand dollars is chump change. I mean, the cost of setting these things up, and it's a it's a very small number. And you look at the uh, value of our capital stock and the value of the staff. Uh, doing the training and the coordinating, I would just challenge you, particularly the uh, rail car rental, um, maybe the platform station rental and, and the police. I mean, it's, uh, I, I, I think from a value standpoint, uh, the way if we change those numbers and increase them so. Uh, duly noted, uh, we try to be competitive with other uh, major players, including that's not on here in New York and uh, Chicago, but we, we will certainly take that under advisement to make sure that we're competitive and that we are pricing ourselves in a way that we could, as I pointed out, uh, use this as a, um, an opportunity to generate additional revenue. And I would just thing to that is they're not going to, if they're going to film it, in Atlanta, they're going to film in Atlanta. So these these numbers don't cause anybody to pack up way else. It's just a comment. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, if I may, it's Roberta. Do I have the floor? Of course, go ahead, Roberta. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things that, that I know is obvious, but I don't want <clears throat> anybody maybe looking at these minutes sometime later to assume that we didn't know but you know we need to acknowledge that a lot of this filming is also done outside of Atlanta proper um Fayette County uh which Virgil I know you know very well as well as uh um up in the north and and just all around um MARTA is central to it but um we definitely want to acknowledge that we know um uh, that it goes well beyond Atlanta and also, just for um, just, just just to put it on the record, <laughs> um, I had the pleasure of being appointed to the very first uh, film and entertainment committee in the legislature. And I'm proud of the work that that we've done that I was involved in uh, for the time of my tenure. So thank you so much. <laughs> and Roberta, you make a really, really, really good point because Atlanta is only one of the major many places people um, use for filming. Savannah is another big location, obviously uh, in Fayette County, where um, um, uh, yeah, not, not that, but the Georgia Film Academy is located. Is it Pinewood down there? Pinewood is there. Um, Rome, um, we, all over the all over the state. I mean, it's it's nine and a half billion dollars in revenue is statewide it's not just atlanta but uh, certainly there are some really significant productions that happen and occur across the state and we, what we wanted to point out was just those productions that that have been uh filmed using martyr assets right 
right. But even in that, you've got your your crew and you've got, you know, the the, the teams and staff they they're also using Mark. Um, so that 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 doesn't take anything away from from Atlanta or from Marta, but just to make sure that we put it on the record that we know, you know, it goes well beyond. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions for uh, Representative Flood? And this is Bill Floyd. Yes, Mr. Mayor. A question for virtual. I constantly, excuse me, constantly see people standing on top of a Decatur station or something like that, filming or taking pictures that are obviously some sort of like that. Do we keep up with that or is it something that happens and we just let it happen or it just happens if it's, it's on MARTA property? If they're using MARTA property, they, they must uh, get permission to do so. They must go through our, our uh, process for insurance, for training. So if, if, if they are doing it, they have come through a formalized process to give them permission to, to do any filming on in, in those locations on Decatur Station. Um, now, if someone's doing something and they're not, you know, there there are cases where people could do something illegally. But if they're if if they are filming, uh, they should have permission. And if our police or anyone else sees them, they would 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 know that they've got permission and allow them to continue. But more often than not, they've gotten um, approval from us in some fashion or another. And you may have seen That's a lot of film. No, it's not. It's not. We don't, we don't have a lot of rogue production activities in our system. Okay, thank you. Uh, just, just as a quick aside for you to, to get a perspective, um, since we've been tracking revenue since 2016. And from 2016 up to the first couple of months of 2020, we generated uh, just under $436,000 in revenue for filming. Um, with 2020, just in a couple of months of 2020, which probably was most of the production of 2019, we generated $141,500. So we have an opportunity to increase that significantly as production uh, activities start to increase after COVID regulations put in place. One other point before we uh, leave is we had legislation in 2020 that um, was passed by the General Assembly. It's not been signed by the governor yet, but it's HB 1037 that would uh, require film production companies to go through an audit to make sure that they're, they're, they're pre um, presenting actual and true costs that are, that are being expended here in, in the state to uh, just to put a little bit more um, scrutiny around ensuring that the dollars that were the thirty percent tax credit is actually for thirty percent of this dollar spent in the in the uh, in the state, but it's it's a it's a good thing. It makes sense, and it won't it won't cause any negative impact to us. It's a good it's a good positive step for just oversight. Virgil, um, going back to safety for for a minute. Um, are there protections in place? I'm sure there must be, but are, is MARTA at, at, um, at risk of being liable for any, um, you know, accidents, injuries, uh, you know, anything major? Are we, are we protected from anything that happens on our properties that, that the uh, film is, is uh, producing? Yes, ma'am. Uh, every contract is reviewed by our risk and legal department. A contract requires a level of insurance, uh, as well as a number of waivers and training, uh, in addition to uh, uh, we review the script, we review uh, the filming activities, we have uh, personnel on site, they, the, the production companies are required to have security and um, safety measures in place on site, but yes, we have a significant number of layers of protection. Thank you, Mr. Sorry, I cut you off. 
No, I was just saying thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all very much. Yep. Yeah, Miss Miss Scott. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. I would like to add regarding the inner like to add regarding the entertainment industry response to Ms. On. Please understand that the entertainment in industry itself and the workers have been impacted by COVID-19. They're um, looking forward to getting back to work, but I they have been impacted well and laid off in regards to COVID-19. So we're hoping that as the workers get back to work, that they are also able to Marta in a manner. We're ready for them to get back to work. <laughs> and they're trying. <laughs> yes. <clears throat> Anybody else? Okay, Mr. Flood, Representative Flood, thank you very much. Uh, thank we you, will sir. now go to uh, Stephanie Fisher for our media impressions update. Can you all see my full screen? No. Okay. Well, that's not the answer I wanted. All right, hang on. I can see Al. <laughs> Stand by. All right. Now, can everyone see? Yes. Excellent. Well, good morning, Chairman Ash, Mr. Parker, Mr. Flood, and committee members. It's a pleasure to come before you to provide an overview of our media impressions for the first six months of 2020. This has been an interesting year. Typically, you welcome a lot of news coverage. But over the past six months, there are certainly moments when staying out of the news was considered a win. In January, our attention was focused on encouraging involvement in the 2020 census. The general manager traveled to Washington, D.C. to join Georgia's first lady to pledge Marta's support in helping to stop human trafficking. We were the subject of an AJC story on employee sexual harassment claims that was part of an ongoing series of investigations by the paper. This led to us re-examining employee cases and reorganizing how these claims are handled internally. The majority of the 337 news stories in January registered as neutral, including a comprehensive piece done by Progressive Railroading on the MARTA 2040 expansion plans. Positive stories such as an update on the King Memorial TOD resulted in an advertising value equivalent of $4 million. MARTA shared news of several high profile hires and promotions in February. The general manager named second in command positions for bus and rail operations and the MARTA police department welcomed a new chief. We also named our first ever chief customer experience officer to oversee the very first riders advisory council. And we announced the 2020 locations of our popular Breeze pop-up stores. Hold on, it's not, there we go. Of the 211 news stories in February, most were neutral. However, there were two incidents at North Avenue Station that did impact service that registered as negative. Our Valentine's Day themed customer appreciation event helped us garner $4 million worth of advertising value. We began the fourth iteration of our track renovation project in March, and then COVID-19 began to dominate the news. Beginning on March 3rd, we spread word of our enhanced cleaning measures and asked customers to be vigilant in protecting themselves from the virus. By the end of the month, we had informed the media of service and operational changes, primarily on our bus system, to protect the health of our customers, and our employees. 
March was our second busiest news month with 735 stories and an advertising value equivalent of $8 million. The general manager's interviews on the service changes registered as positive, and some of the early issues we had with bus crowding received negative news coverage. In April, the news coverage shifted from customer impacts of COVID to employee impacts of COVID. We lost an employee to the virus in April. We informed the media of our employee leave policy and bus crowding mitigation measures to protect operators, and we communicated our essential service plan. All of this can received considerable news coverage, most of it registering as neutral. Our virtual press conference with the general manager and AT leadership announcing hero pay for our frontline employees garnered positive coverage. There were no negative stories among the 321 captured in April, and those stories had an advertising value equivalent of $4 million. Essential employees, like our transit workers, were lauded in May. You may remember the flyover that was done to honor them. We also celebrated Marta Police Chief Wanda Dunham after she announced her retirement. And you all know Chief like I do, so you know she was out there handing out masks and helping until that very last day on the job. The general manager joined the heads of other large transit agencies for a virtual press conference calling for more federal aid to offset the huge revenue losses incurred by COVID. Our news coverage in May got a boost from a celebrity endorsement. Ludacris and Mike Will Made It led the effort to have masks sewn and donated to Marta's frontline workers. Stories on the donation were all positive, although they were registered as neutral. We did receive negative news coverage after suicides at Brookhaven and Midtown stations. The 226 news stories in May had an advertising value equivalent of $8 million. June ushered in a movement that knocked COVID off the front page. We sent information to the press daily regarding how our service would be impacted by the protests in downtown Atlanta, balancing the budget, opening up our fresh markets, and planning to reopen Dome Station to provide direct access to the country's largest voting precinct, which happened on Monday, were all bright spots in the month of news coverage. These newsworthy events, combined with the completion of the Inman Park Reynolds Town Station project, resulted in 830 news stories, our most in any month this year. It also led to our greatest advertising value equivalent of $9 million. 83% of the news stories this year in which MARTA was the focus were positive or neutral. And in a six month period where we have seen unprecedented newsworthy events, I think that's impressive. I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Anybody have any questions for Ms. Fisher? I do, Ms. Scott. I just have one quick question. Yes, ma'am. The early in regards to for the State Farm Arena Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday. Do we have any idea of what the early voting turnout number has been for that location? I don't, but I can certainly find out. Does anyone else have information? This is Erica. Ms. Scott. Updates. I'll, I'll get that to the um, board and to the team today. Ms. Scott, this is, this is Melissa. I know that on Monday, on the first day, they had 146 voters come through State Farm. Okay. Thank you. That's 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 the level uh, right right now. Sort of a, a trickle. Thank you, Stephanie. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Uh, Roberta, I uh, just wanted to go back to the the um, story you highlighted with um, uh, CEO Parker uh, on the human trafficking. Was um, it any? Uh, were there any inclusions of the heroic efforts of, of Chief Donovan and, and our Martyr Police in in stopping or preventing what could have been a tragic human trafficking um, episode? Hey, 
Hey, Stephanie, this is Jeff. I think we got some um, press around that when it happened, I believe. I believe. But I don't know if, if the media picked up on that related to the uh, event that uh, Secretary Chow did in Washington. Yes. I don't think. I don't think uh, Marta uh, actually picked up on it. Yes, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, ma'am. Any more questions for me? None here. Um, the only, uh, I, I guess I have one question, which is before we started, we were chatting and I heard that our mask usage had recently spiked. Um, have we gotten any questions about that or? From the media? strikes me as, as good news. Yes, um, and no, we have not received any inquiries about it, but I, I certainly think we'll be pushing out that good message. Yeah, the, 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 uh, the numbers just came in from the survey this morning. Um, so we're, so we're kind of working on how to, how to message that, but we definitely want to draw attention to it. Well, thank you all very much. Thanks, Ms. Fisher. Thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda is a 2020 legislative wrap up uh, from Ms. Holloman. Yes, good morning. I'm beginning to share my screen. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Parker and external relations committee members. My name is Dominique Holloman and I'm the Government Affairs Program Manager here to provide you with the 2020 Legislative Wrap-Up. A 2020 MARGA legislative priorities are broken down into three categories. One, a focus on our jurisdictions, DeKalb, Fulton, Clayton Counties, and the City of Atlanta. Here we focused on the 15th Amendment, executing and communicating the State of Good Repair Capital Program, executing and communicating our MARTA 2040 expansion in Clayton and the city of Atlanta, all while supporting Fulton and DeKalb County and identifying funding for expansion plans. The second part of our legislative priorities is relationship building at the state and federal level. The specific focus on deepening relationships with our governor, lieutenant governor and speaker, additional house and senate leadership, working to establish relationships with those legislative rising stars, as well as deepening relationships with our aligned agencies, ARC, the ATL, and the Georgia Department of Transportation. Our final priority is our MARTOC management audit as required by HB 213. As we are aware, this session was quite unusual being suspended March 13th due to COVID reconvening June 15th with Sine Die on June 26th. Several things happened in this session of importance to us. The first is our state budget being passed with 10% cuts. Originally, this was supposed to be a budget with 14% cuts. Um, so it's to our benefit that those cuts were minimized. The, set, the first bill of importance is House Bill 276, the Marketplace Facilitator Bill. This bill collects any remaining third party sales tax as it relates to e-commerce not previously collected under other bills. This will sweep up more transactions into our jurisdictional sales tax. The next bill is House Bill 511. This was originally a rural transit bill, but became a bill regarding the ATL with minor updates, primarily focused on cleaning up their board terms. Next is House Bill 105 which is the Uber and Lyft excise scheme. House Bill 105 takes Uber and Lyft out of that marketplace facilitator bill I previously mentioned and changes it to a 50 cent per individual ride, 25 cent shared ride exit excise tax, excise fee per ride. Pre-COVID, this was expected to generate $40 million annually statewide. It is noted that about one third of Uber trips are in MARTA's jurisdictions. 
funds from House Bill 105 shall be appropriated to a transit provider, any of which receive federal formula funds for a transit capital project. It's noted that this year, the ATL's administrative budget was funded out of House Bill 170 non-motor fuel excise fees. These are heavy vehicle and hotel motel fees. And House Bill 105 also limits those expenditures to transit to 10%. Heavy vehicle fees are about $15 million annually and hotel motel fees are about $180 million annually. The next bill of significance is Senate Bill 359, which is a COVID liability bill. This bill creates a gross negligence standard for entities and broadly defines premises as any property owned, occupied, leased, operated, maintained, or managed by an individual entity, whether residential, agricultural, commercial, industrial, or other real property located within the state of Georgia. This law definitely applies to modest stations and facilities. However, it is less clear whether it would apply to revenue or non-revenue vehicles. Now that we are requiring masks and because of our thorough cleaning protocols, we hope that this is a non-issue for us. This bill expires April 2021. Uh, next is our MARTOC management audit as required by House Bill 213. Compilation of the audit is underway with delivery scheduled for August 28, 2020. Lastly, we have our human trafficking campaign as Ms. Fisher noted. Mr. Parker signed the anti-trafficking pledge. This also helped to deepen and um, continue to build our relationship with the governor and first lady Kemp as this is a priority for her. Our media partner Outfront Media has developed a PSA in the first round of this campaign that is now visible on Marta's digital assets. At this time, I'm happy to take any questions about the material as presented. Who has questions for Ms. Holloman? Yeah, this is a uh, Rod Frierson. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, I have a question. Uh, the, this, the SB 359, um, can you explain to me again what that liability uh, insurance or liability bill, how does it relate to transit specifically? Well, it creates a, a gross negligence standard for premises. So anyone who would come on our premises, um, our stations or any other real property that we own and possibly be exposed to COVID, it creates a gross negligence standard in terms of liability that could possibly be created by exposure. Okay, okay. So that's for the general public, if they come to our stations, I just want to make sure I'm clear. And it covers us concern, concerning the liability of them being on our transit system. It would also cover our potential liability to our employees. Oh, it would. Okay. So, so does that apply for uh, for all transit systems in Georgia, or yes. just it does? Okay. okay. All right. Thank you. Anybody else? Did we have any big pieces we were working on this year that we feel like we made progress on, but are going to need to revisit in 2021? No, not at this time. Uh, let, let, let me. So, so I, you know, I, I believe we've made significant progress on um, the uh, the Uber and Lyft tax, and um, you know, although the, the bill is is um, has passed and uh and and you know the expectation is the governor will sign it in, into law um the effort around that is is uh working and advocating uh for money to go to marta directly um related to that so so really a big focus that, that we will have um and we'll be working with our gr team around that as a strategy of trying to uh you know, identify projects that, that could potentially get into the, the governor's budget, because it's my understanding that that 
um, the the genesis for the funding will come through the you know we'll at least start with the governor's budget for for that those funds. And I think and I think the other thing is that 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 you know we've made a good point around that the um, the other funding sources, particularly uh, hotel motel tax, have have virtually not gone to transit. Um, and so I think particularly in the House, um, with, uh, you know, the help of uh, Representative Smyre and, and uh, working with the Speaker's office, I think there's, a, there's an awareness that uh, although when that bill was, was passed to create all those funding sources and, and provide an opportunity to fund transit, they, they largely have not. So I think we've got a great opportunity in front of us with this Uber and Lyft tax. Yeah, Robbie, and this is Virgil. I think to Jeff's point, we still have. Um, I think the two two things are related. One thing that we 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 advanced was the relationship and the depth of the relationships with the new leadership in the House and in the Senate, mm -hmm. um, even with some of the you know, more senior people like uh, Representative Smyre, who's been very helpful to us, because we're going to need them to help uh, ensure that we get through the governor's budget, um, and then it, once it, once it's presented in the House. Um, Funding through um, you know, House Bill 105 to support transit. It, it's not a, it's not a given that funding will be a part of the. the it's, we have to ask for it, but the dollars have to be appropriated to us. And are they they be appropriated for capital projects? Is that my understanding? Correct. Okay, and they're they're are they designated in the statute to go to transit capital projects, or are they? <laughs> eligible to be spent more broadly I and mean, i know that we wouldn't get all of the transit capital project money but if it is limited to transit capital projects you know yeah i think got a few of those yeah i think it is but i'll verify for that for you um, yeah that was my understanding of the progress that we made on that topic but yeah. i i could be wrong there have been a few other things going on and yeah, i believe speech. that it's I, I i believe that it's language that um that makes a statement around prioritizing it to um, to transit capital projects, but I don't think that um, you know because it goes through the, the the appropriations process without a constitutional amendment, which which is you know not likely like the like the excise tax has. There's no way to absolutely designate it to any single source. So so we do have to um, advocate for that. On those, Melissa, on does that does that sound sound right? We'll, we'll follow up. We don't need to hold everyone up, but but that's this is an important issue. She was on. Melissa was on earlier, but maybe she went around another West Virginia mountainside and. <laughs> but, no, uh, she's around. In in the bill, it says transit projects means a capital project to establish, enhance, maintain, or improve a transit system. So it yeah. does specify transit capital projects. Okay. Anything else for Ms. Holloman or our executive team? Uh, Mr. Ash, this is yes, um, Chair. Um, I just wanted to take a moment for those of us that are here today to welcome Marie Peters, who's our new executive manager for the board. And she is um, online helping us for the first time. And we just wanted to say welcome. Welcome. Yes. Yes, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Welcome to, uh, our new den mother. All right. <laughs> I look forward to meeting you in person. This is a I look forward to meeting anybody new in person. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, well, hearing any, is there any other business to come before the external affairs committee? Yes, this is Alicia Ivy. Yes, Miss Ivy. Um, may I kindly ask that we have a moment of silence for Reverend Dr. C.T. Vivian, as he is being late to rest today, uh, one of our most prolific civil rights icons, not only in this in the state of Georgia, but nationally. Thank you. Thank you very much.
thinking about him and Congressman Lewis, I am reminded of a story I read years ago that someone interviewed the security guard, a security guard whose whose job it is is to stand in the Sistine Chapel every day uh, and prevent, you know, prevent people from doing something stupid in the Sistine Chapel. And they asked him, you know, what is it like to be in the presence of such magnificence on a daily basis? And he said, you know, after a, a short while, you really just don't think about it. And here in Atlanta, we are incredibly blessed to have been in the physical and spiritual presence of so many incredible leaders. I mean, I, I would encounter Congressman Lewis on a regular basis. And the fact that the extraordinary was ordinary simply by virtue of the repetition of it um, is something we should be conscious of because it was an incredible blessing uh, that those men and women uh, shared with us over their lives. And, you know, something too easy to take for granted just by virtue of the fact of how often we were able to see it and see them and hear from them. But so thank you, Ms. Ivy, for reminding us to be conscious of it. Thank you very much. And, and you're absolutely right. Growing up, uh, seeing both Congressman John Lewis and seeing uh, Dr. Reverend C.T. Vivian in my own neighborhood, um, it is just uh, amazing. But also, as you said, we take for granted of that. And thank you very much for everyone's time and taking a moment of silence. Thank you, Alicia, for bringing it forward. I wanted to um, say something as well, but in these few days, I haven't been able to utter a word about either one of them who I've known since I was a child. Um, but I will tell you one funny story. Um, you know, as brilliant as Dr. Vivian was, you never saw him write anything. He had a photographic memory. Uh, he never wrote. And so, but he was always cracking people up. So that's how he would get other people off guard. We took a trip to South Africa. We were doing some work in South Africa. And believe it or not, my job was to keep Dr. Vivian from cracking everybody up. And recently, he and I were together last year, and Don really said, what did you say to him to get him to get that big old grin and that big old laugh like that? And I told him, um, I just reminded him of some things in South Africa, and he didn't want to go back. <laughs> he, he, didn't, he didn't want to go back. Okay. <laughs> but just through, I mean, just through leaders, both of them, John saved my life in 91, um, both of them. Um, but also, as Robbie said, ordinary men, always approachable, never above you, uh, never made you feel like that. And uh, for that reason, I mean, for many reasons, but, you know, I've been knocked for a blow with the three deaths because uh, I've always said that their feet. It's, it's hard. It's hard. I will say that Dr. Lowry's daughter uh, asked if we were going to be naming something after him. So I'll put it out there now, Robin. <laughs> well, oh, well, let's not let's let's not sidetrack this by talking about naming things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, my view but, hadn't you know, changed, but I suspect all, other people's hasn't either. So you know. <laughs> right. have also recognize the role that they play in leading to uh, uh, writing public transit to advancing. The growth yes. of public transit, I mean, it's much different um, when you talk about that and relate to what we do every day, what we do, we're supposed to be doing every day. Mm -hmm. We can't, we cannot do that. Thank you, thank you. Mm. Have a good uh, day. Uh, Roberta, and I, I, I will conclude in saying this, uh, I'm so privileged that in my community that I grew up in, we have the largest repository of mm -hmm. presidential freedom medalists, and they mm -hmm. all lived in my community. Uh, Ambassador Young, mm -hmm. Dr. Reverend C.T. Vivian, uh, Joseph Lowry, mm -hmm. Hank Aaron, um, and lastly, I think, what did I? Yeah, I did say Hank Aaron. Mm -hmm. uh, and Ambassador Young. So we have five 
that live in our community. And so for me, watching them just being in the, the store or at the gas station and admonishing me and teaching me, I am so at a loss for words because we've lost something very rare and precious. But also we all can learn from them and leadership and knowing that we can all work together for the good. Yes. And so as I look at each and every one of you today, I'm reminded of how well we all work together for the good of all of the people uh, in this great city and in this state. So I'm very pleased to work with each of you in that spirit. So as we move along, Chairman Ash, I don't want to take up much of your time in your committee today, but thank you very much for your time. Wonderful. And Alicia, you know, that, that community was also graced with uh, greats like Ozell Sutton. Um, and, and I would make the Saturday visits and just go from house to house to house. You know, just take one Saturday and visit each one of them. Just go around, the, go around the corner. They will all be missed. Yes, Hopefully. it will. Mm -hmm. Is there any other business to come before the committee at this time, or may we adjourn on those incredibly important remembrances? Thank you. Hearing none. Everybody okay. stay safe and be well. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you all. Thank, Thank you. you. This, this meeting is adjourned. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. Glad to be on. Bye. Bye. Hey, after this one, I don't know. I didn't find it. Why is there another meeting? We're doing business.